so tickled to be here. I start grinning around Jonesboro. And you know that the only reason anyone would grin in Jonesboro is that you know you're headed to James River. Um, Because there's just not a whole lot there. And so by the time I get from Nashville to Jonesboro, I'm just wiggly in the car because I know y'all are right around the corner. And there's no other house in the country I feel more at home in than James River. Um, Debbie is the sister I've always wanted. Is she, we're the same age, but she's a mentor. She's much sweeter than me. So like I stand close to Debbie that I'll get sweeter. It'll rub off. And then Pastor John, uh, I, ju- I trust him implicitly. I've come to him many times. I'm finishing up a doctorate at Denver Seminary, and I'll come to Pastor John and go, can you help me understand this? And he's so kind to put uh, really complex cookies on a lower shelf so I can understand a little more uh, the character of God. So I just, I have a huge crush on this particular church and this particular community. So thank you. It is so fun to be here. I want to, I want to start with a quick story and then we're going to dive into the Christmas story. And I hope we're going to see a few new wrinkles together of a story that is very familiar. But the first story I want to talk with is not from the Holy Writ. It's actually from Haiti. It's uh, the first time Missy and I went back after I adopted her. For those of you I haven't had the undeserved privilege of meeting, I became a mom through the miracle of adoption when I was 50 years old. So I went through menopause and motherhood at the same time. And I adopted my daughter from Haiti, and she's somewhere running around in your kids' ministry. She wants us to move here so she can be at James River all the time. But, um, but the first Christmas, we went back to Haiti. Um, I just wanted to be there. We were there the week before Christmas. I just wanted to be there because I wanted to love on Missy's extended family. And, and there's many there that we're praying will come to know Jesus. And a lot of the people in the tiny rural village Missy grew up with think I am a high voodoo priestess because Missy's first mama died of undiagnosed AIDS. Marie, I can't wait to meet her in glory. But because of the undiagnosed AIDS, Missy has HIV and Missy had tuberculosis and cholera and was incredibly malnourished. And so most of the people in that village, because they rarely had electricity at this time, they assumed this little girl named Melissa had already died. And so when we came back the first time to the village, they all began to shriek. And then they began to point at me and say I was a high voodoo priestess. And I said, no, 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 no. Just see, just see Jesus. Jesus is the one who healed my daughter and Marie's daughter. Jesus is the one she's healthy. Jesus is the reason that Missy now, her HIV is completely undetectable. She's considered long-term undetectable. That's just Jesus. That's just Jesus. And so we decided I would come back in December and they would have just a little, little tiny kind of sisterhood, almost like DFL, only not with flying things or beautiful stages or merch. It was only about a hundred women in this tiny, tiny community center, hot as can be, even though it's December and Christmas time in Haiti, it was still 112 degrees. And I said, I'll keep the message really, really short because really all I'm talking about is the withness of Jesus, Emmanuel, God with us. And I want to explain to them that God with us is why Missy is alive and not dead. He didn't just come to make us better. He came to bring dead people back to life. And I said, it's just going to be real short. I was teaching through an interpreter, about a hundred women. Most were there out of curiosity. They were just there because they, they wondered what I would do, this big, pale voodoo priestess in stretchy pants. And so that's, that's why they're there. It's just curiosity. And so I, I'm, I'm in this message and I was trying to be kind of engaging because of course they couldn't understand English. So I had this interpreter and maybe 10 minutes into the message, this woman who was on the very front, it wasn't even a pew, it was a rough hewn wooden bench, woman in the very front, older woman, probably my age, 60-ish, she just stands up and in Creole, out loud, she says, I need a miracle. Because I was talking about the miracle of Christmas. I need a miracle. Now, I can't speak Creole very well, but I can hear it. I thought that's what she said. So I turned to my interpreter and I said, did she say she needs a miracle? And he said, yep, that's exactly what she said. And I said, well, I haven't ended. I have a really good closing story that I think would be 
engaging, but it seems like we need to pause and see what kind of miracle she needs. And so I said, well, you tell them just to chat amongst themselves and, and we'll go over and see what miracle she needs. And so we did that. We walk over to this woman and I said, what kind of miracle do you need through the interpreter? And she lifts up her dress. And when she does, she exposes her left knee and it's the size of a cantaloupe. And I have a ton of friends in the medical community, but I don't have any medical background. But even as a neophyte medically, I thought that's the worst infection I've ever seen up close in my whole life. I mean, her knee was just it was revolting. It was, it, it was toxic. It was, I, I've never seen a knee like that. And I was like, oh, yep, she needs a miracle. She needs a bad, bad miracle. And I was like, oh, oh. And you know how you don't know what to do right in that moment because I hadn't been to Wednesday night at James River yet. And so I was a little flustered <laughs> with, this, with this big old knee. And I thought, oh, I remembered I had brought peppermint oil with me back over on this bench where I was sitting. I had some peppermint oil because I learned going back and forth to Haiti that some of their smells are very unique and they're not like the smells in Nashville. And I'm a sissy tail and I would get sick. And so I learned if I would just dab peppermint oil under my nose, I wouldn't get nauseous. So I thought I'll go grab some peppermint oil because the stench of her knee was, was pretty overwhelming. But also I had read somewhere that peppermint oil was a natural anesthetic. And I thought, I'll rub that on her knee. And y'all, I was on my knees praying for her healing. I was praying with all the faith I had. I was praying the, the promise that a lot of times we'll pray up here, that by his stripes, he said, you can be healed. Because the stripe, stripes I took on my back on the cross. I'm praying that. But what I'm thinking logically is this woman is going to be healed, if at all, uh, in two weeks. Because there's a missionary group coming in two weeks that includes doctors and nurses, and they have medicine. And this woman needs medicine. There's no way something that bad, I mean, it looks like gangrene, they may have to amputate. There's no way something that bad could be healed without medical intervention. Well, I was really passionate as I was praying, and I was pressing as I was praying, and then I realized, oh, dang. I have been so enthusiastic in my prayer because my mom was Baptist, but dad was AG, and I have more dad's genes. So I've been real passionate in my prayer, and I realized I have, I have squeezed her knee, this horrifically infected knee, and I've caused the swelling to go north, which is really dangerous if you know anything about infections, because that means it goes further, closer to the heart. And I thought, oh my goodness, I've exacerbated this woman's injury. And so I opened my eyes just to see what kind of damage I've done. And when I opened my eyes, unless you're a James River regular, you, like me, would have been stunned. If somebody had told me this happened on television, I'd think they're just about to ask me for a check. When I opened my eyes, her knee had gone from the size of a cantaloupe all the way back to normal. Her knee was completely normal. And it had happened under my hands. But unlike y'all who've grown accustomed to miracles because of what God is pouring out, unlike y'all, I did not clap and I did not cheer. This was my response. I was like, oh my goodness, oh my goodness, it's a cantaloupe. Now it's a plum. I can't believe it. I can't believe it. I just went bananas. It, it almost scared me. And it was just such a shock because I wasn't expecting it. It was such a shock. And after I quit having a cow, I was probably jumping around and screaming for two or three minutes. I looked back at the woman whom the miracle had happened to. And she wasn't jumping around like a nut. She was just standing there and she had the most beautiful expression. And her expression was that of wonder. And in that moment, Holy Spirit spoke to me and he said, you need to raise the bar. You need to make room for a miracle. You bring so much logic to the table and I've given you that mind, but you've taken logic to an extreme. And unless you can prove it cognitively, you don't believe I can do anything up, up beyond your cognitive understanding. He said, I need you to move your gray matter just a little bit to make room for a miracle. I think in America, we've grown so used to studying God as a proposition 
we've almost lost the capacity to just be awestruck by who he is. Just to be awestruck. Now hear me, I'm not advocating that you check your mind at the door. That's gotten us in trouble in evangelical society. It's gotten us in trouble to not have wisdom as we run toward Jesus, as we share the hope that lies within us to the world around us. But I'm saying you've got to make room for wonder. You've got to make sure your gray matter is not riding shotgun, but that your heart is up there too. You've got to make room for wonder. Open your Bibles to Luke 2. My hope is that today Holy Spirit will speak to us and we will begin to recapture the wonder that is Christmas. It's not a regular kind of season. It has nothing to do with shopping or Mariah Carey. In those days, Luke chapter 2, verse 1, in those days, a decree went out from Caesar Augustus that all the world should be registered. This was the first registration when Quirinius was governor of Syria, and all went to be registered, each to his own town. And Joseph also went up from Galilee, from the town of Nazareth, to Judea, to the city of David, which is called Bethlehem, because he was of the house and lineage of David, to be registered with Mary, his betrothed, who was with child. And while they were there, the time came for her to give birth, and she gave birth to her firstborn son, wrapped him in swaddling clothes, and laid him in a manger, because there was no place for them in the inn and in the same region. There were shepherds out in the field, keeping watch over their flock by night, and an angel of the Lord appeared to them, and the glory of the Lord shone around them, and they were filled with fear. And the angel said to them, fear not, for behold, I bring you good news of a great joy that will be for all the people, for unto you is born this day. If you're comfortable writing in your Bibles, and I hope some of you still have brick and mortar Bibles. I'm not anti the Bible on iPads or iPhones. I think it's cool. We carry God's word with us in technology. But if your only Bible has an on-off switch, that's like an old man in short shorts. That is sad. Um, and so if you can't afford a Bible, if you're new to James River, please, please, please see somebody in the foyer afterwards. We'd love to hook you up with a brick and mortar Bible. This doesn't make it holier, y'all. This doesn't make it any more significant. It's just we're so stinking human that sometimes we need tangible. And there have been seasons in my life, there have been Christmas seasons in my life that were so lonely and so not what I hoped they would be that I slept with this book on my chest because I needed to be that close to the promises of God. If you've got a brick and mortar Bible, it's not holier. It just helps us to remember, underscore this day or today is what might be said in verse 11 in your translation. For unto you is born this day or today in the city of David a Savior who is Christ the Lord. And this will be a sign for you. You will find a baby wrapped in swaddling cloths and lying in a manger. And suddenly there was with the angel a multitude of the heavenly host praising God and saying, Glory to God in the highest. And on earth, peace among those with whom he is pleased. When the angels went away from them into heaven, the shepherds said to one another, let us go over to Bethlehem and see this thing that has happened, which the Lord has made known to us. And they went with haste and found Mary and Joe and the baby lying in a manger. Just the baby was lying in the manger, not Mary and Joe. And when they saw it, they made known the saying that had been told them concerning this child and all who heard it wondered underscore or highlight that word as well, at least in your mind or highlight it even in your iPhone, wondered at what the shepherds told them. But Mary treasured up all these things, pondering them in her heart, and the shepherds returned, glorifying and praising God for all they had heard and seen as it had been told them. There's a couple of small miracles in this passage that I think we often miss we see some of the bigger, louder miracles. The, the healing of a knee was a big miracle that Christmas for me. But it's usually the small miracles I've missed that have paved the way for the bigger miracles. And I've often wondered, why don't you allow me to steward big miracles? And oftentimes the Lord says, because you haven't been faithful in the smaller ones. 
because I've given you so many you've tripped over and you didn't notice there are so many miracles in your life, Lisa, that you have yet to call miracle because you're waiting on something huge like a new liver instead of recognizing what I've already given you time and time and time and time again. The beginning of Luke 2, there's, I, 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 this probably isn't a jewel. I want to look at some of the jewels in this passage, the beautiful little diamonds. This is more of a cubic zirconia, but I love I love that in the beginning of this passage, they go to Bethlehem. In Hebrew, that would be bit lahim. Bit means house. Lahim means the bread. And I just love that Jesus isn't keto. I, I love that right there from the beginning, he's like, come get some carbs, baby. We're going to the house of bread. Now, that's not really the miracle. The miracle, as he goes on to later, refer to himself as the bread of life. I'm the one who will sustain you. But I just love that Jesus is born in the house of bread, not the house of kale. Isn't that awesome? So that, that's not really a miracle, but that's just a little wrinkle that I thought would bless some of you in stretchy pants. Um, the second wrinkle I want to look at that's all, often skipped over in this story is the shepherds themselves. Because first century culture, of 21st century culture, we tend to think of shepherds like cute little boys in bathrobes in nativity plays. But that's not an ancient shepherd. Not at all. An ancient shepherd was transient, effectively homeless. They were illiterate. They were not allowed in ceremonial worship. So we could not have had a shepherd. If this was a first century gathering, Jewish gathering, there would be no shepherds in the house this morning. They're not allowed in corporate worship because of their reputation well earned for thievery. Shepherds were not allowed to be witnesses in a legal court case in the first century. Their testimonies were considered not credible because they tended to have a problem with the truth. So you've got these itinerant, illiterate, very stinky men who are excluded from worship. If we were first century Jews, we might hire a shepherd to clean out the garage. We wouldn't invite them over for dinner. You've got this group of outliers and our sovereign God says, hmm, let me see who I'm going to choose to be in every nativity play from now forward. Let me see what people group I'll choose to be the very first witness to the incarnation outside of Mary and Joe. I'll choose a group of people no one else would vote for. They would have been voted off the island from the inception. I'll choose that group, that people group. I'll choose shepherds. Luke, you've got to remember, is a Gentile author. We've got 66 books in our Protestant Bibles, the only books we know definitively that were written by a non-Jew are Luke and the Acts of the Apostles, and he wrote those two together. Pastor John, I'm sure, has told you many times in David they were written as a seamless document, most likely, so they're kind of like Star Wars and the Empire Strikes Back. So if you're in the habit of reading through the Bible in a year, skip over John when you get to John's gospel after Luke, and then go back for John later. Read Luke and Acts together. I know y'all been in Acts for a long time. I love the book of Acts. The book of, book of Acts and the book of Luke are synergistic, both written by Luke, a non-Jew, a Gentile. Can you see, by the way, he's talking about Christmas, that he's trying to help us understand it's an all-access event. It's not just for the elite. It's not just for women who wear leather pants. I've noticed a lot of women my age now preach in leather pants, and I can't, because if I do, it sounds like ducks are being killed. And so I'm so grateful I'm so grateful for the inclusivity of the gospel. He doesn't reveal himself to the best and the brightest. He says, we'll take the bottom of the pile. We'll take shepherds. And the shepherds are the ones that will reveal the incarnation to John Nolan is a, a wonderful Australian theologian. People talk about Jesus in an Australian accent. I will rededicate my life. I love that accent. And John Nolan talks about that facet of Christmas, that little miracle. He calls it the, the divine humility. He calls it the humility of the divine condescension. 
Isn't that beautiful? The humility of the divine condescension. God didn't just become man. He became man and he was born in a feeding trough, not at the Four Seasons. He revealed himself to outliers, not to the in crowd. The humility of the divine condescension, which makes sense when you get to verse 20, when it says, verse 18, actually, when it says, and all who heard it wondered at what the shepherds told them. The word wonder comes from the Greek word thafmazo. It means to be amazed. When the shepherds told the story, people were amazed, not just at the story, but at the kind of people who were telling the story. People nobody else would pick. When the shepherds went, y'all, we saw him. People went, no, you're kidding me. You saw the Lord People wondered, they were amazed, thafmazo, to be amazed. You see it in several other places in the Gospels when the disciples were scared on the Sea of Galilee and the waves were rocking the boat and they were all needing Dramamine and Jesus was taking a nap and they woke him up and he spoke. All he did was speak and the wind and the waves obeyed him. It says the disciples, oh, were thavmazoed. They were amazed at what they saw. I want to ask you a question. What has amazed you recently that was small? What small miracle has amazed you recently? Was there someone sitting at your Thanksgiving table who wasn't there last year? Has there been someone who's agreed to come to worship with you, even though they would say some of the stuff that's happening on Wednesday night is because we're all caffeinated and too demonstrative? What small miracle have you seen in your family recently? Do you have the capacity to be amazed anymore? Has your gray matter made room for miracles? I'm all about logic. There's a lot of abuse in my backstory, a lot of stuff I've been running from for years. And in my foolishness, I thought if I just let my mind steer the course of my life, I won't be hurt anymore. If I just let my mind rule, then logic will keep me from any more pain. And you know what? Full logic kept me from seeing miracles. I got to a place in my life where I was so awe deprived because if I couldn't figure it out, I didn't believe it was true. Do you really want a God that you can completely figure out? Do you want a God that small? I don't want a God that small. I want a God who brings new livers to people who are dying. I want a God who sends an astral projection to a group of illiterate, homeless, stinky sheep herders. That's the God I want. I want a God who is so completely other that my hair is still blown back. After 50 years of walking with that God, I still want to go, oh, I can't believe he did that. When's the last time you wondered? When's the last time you were open-mouthed over the kindness of God. People heard the shepherd's stories and they wondered. Verse 11, for unto you is born this day, this day in the city of David, a savior. The word savior comes to the Greek word. David can tell you sotir. It's where we get the word soteriology from. Fancy word that just has to do with salvation, which has happened 300 and I think it was 78 times at your Christmas services. That's a miracle. We clap politely. 370, what was it, David? 372 men and women and children are no longer dead. 372 men, women, and children are alive. They'll be with Jesus absent from the body, present with Jesus. Do you know how long Zephaniah toiled 
in the Old Testament in his ministry. Do you know how long he toiled? A long time. A really long time from having good eyesight to having bad eyes and stretchy pants. He toiled a long time. Do you know how many salvations he saw over the course of his ministry? None. None. He was faithful day after day after day. Eugene Peterson calls obedience a long walk in the same direction. We don't Go to the left and go to the right, regardless of the drama around us. We're just walking toward Jesus, just keeping step towards it. 372? You've seen 372 in one weekend? Goodness gracious, y'all, don't let that not shock you. Be stunned by that. Be amazed by that. Go to work and say, we're not narrow-minded hate mongers. God saved 372 people. Are you saved? Do you have peace in your heart? What's this Christmas like for you? Come to our house for dinner. I'm so tired of Christians who are no longer able to be awed, who are just like, well, this is just what we do on Sunday. And some of you are like, you haven't been here on a Wednesday night. No, but I'll be here and I'll walk to get here. Because I love to see people who are still going, oh, he's even better than we thought. One of my favorite living theologians, I love all the dead guys. I'll read from one in a second. One of my favorite living theologians says, if you get out of the Bible, out of God's story, what you're expecting to get out of God's story, Dr. Craig Keener, Spirit Hermeneutics, you need to change your expectations. If you aren't still able to go, then you need to read your Bible differently. You need to come up front and say, I need healing because my brain is paralyzed. I need healing because my heart is a paralytic. I need healing because I can't wonder anymore. Luke says today, today, a savior, a deliverer has been brought to you today, today. He uses that, that phraseology today or this day. He uses it 10 more times in this open gospel account. He uses it in, in chapter four. When Jesus is no longer a baby, he's a grown man. He started his itinerant ministry and he goes home to his hometown synagogue. So just think one of these kids from James River College is here. You see him for two or three years all the time. They're up front. They're volunteering. They go away. You get word that they've started a church. You get word that much like James River, their church is having healings. And it's incredible what God is doing in their church. And they have cool merch. And he preaches in leather pants and has tattoos. And he comes back home to James River and he preaches. That's what happened. Only this is Jesus, not a James River student. And he came to Nazareth where he had been brought up. And as, he, as was his custom, he went to the synagogue on the Sabbath day. And he stood up to read. And the scroll of the prophet Isaiah was given to him. Now, Pastor John can tell you that when someone would preach in a hometown synagogue, they didn't have full-time ministers. So it was just men from the community. So that, let's just say normally it'd be Mr. Horowitz or Mr. You know, Levy. They'd come up, they'd read from a scroll, and then they'd give a little devotional. Well, on this day, Jesus has come back home to his hometown synagogue you got to know those Jewish mamas are like, oh, I actually love him. My daughter went to prom with him. Well, he played t-ball with my son. And somebody goes back to the Torah closet, and they bring a Torah scroll to Jesus, and he opens it up, just so happens to be the scroll of Isaiah. And he just so happens in the scroll of Isaiah to turn to the place in the scroll of Isaiah where it is written, the spirit of the Lord is upon me because he has anointed me to proclaim good news to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim liberty to the captives and recovering of sight to the blind, to set at liberty those who are oppressed, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. And they're like, you know, he must be doing a lot of public speaking on the road because he's just gotten so eloquent. We should invite him back here more often. And then Jesus says, I'm not just talking about God. Today, there's that word again. Today, this is happening in front of you. I'm not just talking about God. I am God. I am God. That's when they try to kill him and throw him off a cliff. Over and over and over again in Luke's gospel, he goes, today, y'all, today, today. We don't live keening for Advent. We actually have experienced the witness of Jesus. 
That's why what's happening on Wednesday night is happening on Wednesday night. We are not pining for a far away God. He is with us. We are Christmas people 365 days a year. We've got the withness of God. The witness, that's the whole point of Luke. He goes, today, 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 you don't have to grieve anymore. You don't have to hope anymore. Your hope is fulfilled in Jesus Christ. God came near. One of my favorite, I told you, dead guys, says it this way. This is J.I. Packer. And he says this. Now stay with me. If you have to bite your lips, stay with me because this is amazing. He says, The really staggering Christian claim is that Jesus of Nazareth was God-made man, that the second person of the Godhead became a second man, determining human destiny, the second representative, head of the race, and that he took humanity without the loss of deity. Did you hear that? He took humanity without the loss of deity. So that Jesus of Nazareth was as truly and fully divine as he was Human, the word became flesh, God became man, the divine son became a Jew. The Almighty appeared on earth as a helpless human baby, unable to do more than lie and stare and wriggle and make noises, needing to be fed and changed and taught to talk like any other child. And there was no illusion or deception in this. The babyhood of the Son of God was a reality. The more you think about it, the more staggering it gets. Nothing in fiction is so fantastic as is this truth of the incarnation. One of my best friends was paralyzed in a hit and run accident before Christmas or senior year in high school. And she tried to commit suicide several times. She had completely lost hope. And when she was sent home from the hospital, she said her mother came in her room. Her mother was a really quiet woman named Maybell Whittington, very shy woman. But her mother came in the room and she said, Eva, it's been three months since the accident. And I think it's time for you to learn to put on your jeans by yourself. And Eva said, Mama, I can't put on my jeans by myself. My legs don't work. I've got a back brace all the way down over my hips. I can't do it, Mama. And her mom said, Honey, I think it's time. I think it's time for you to trust that Jesus is with you. And Eva cussed her mama. Just so mad, so frustrated. 17-year-old kid who had lost everything she thought made her whole. She cussed her mama, ordered her mama outside of her room, started crying and carrying on. She thought if she got really dramatic, her mom would come back in the room. Her mom didn't come back in the room. So after crying and carrying on for four or five minutes, she thought, well, I might as well try because mom's not coming back. So she reached down and got the waistband of those jeans and she took one lifeless leg and tried to put it in a pant hole. Then she took the other leg and tried to shove it in a pant hole. Took her 30 minutes to get her jeans up to her knees. She said by then she was sweating. She threw herself back on the pillow and just started bawling, crying. She thought, okay, I've tried. Surely mom will come back in the room if I cry a little harder, if I carry on a little louder. Cried, carried on four or five more minutes, her mama didn't come. So she thought, well, I'm just going to have to, <laughs> just going to have to try again. She leans over, takes the waistband of her jeans, works and works and works and works, and finally gets him up to mid-thigh, falls back, cries and carries on again. Mama doesn't come in the room, sits back up a third time, takes her completely 45 minutes to get those jeans all the way up over the back brace, and finally buttoned. By then, she's just drenched with sweat. She said she was too tired to cry. She just fell back on the bed, exhausted at putting on her pants for the first time since the accident. She said when she fell back quiet that first time, that's when she could hear her mama through those paper thin walls. She could hear her mama crying. Her mama had been next door the entire time, right, right there, right there the entire time time. Her mom had never left her. Her mom just wanted her to grow up. The withness of God. That's Christmas, y'all. Emmanuel. God with us. He took on humanity without the loss of deity. We should be amazed by that. We should be amazed every single day by that, that we don't have to keen and cry and scream for God. He's right there. He never left us, no matter how hard it gets. 
Thank you so much for joining James River Church on our YouTube channel. Our prayer is that you were encouraged and your faith was strengthened today. And we wanna let you know that we'd love for you to be a part of our online family. As well, we'd love if you subscribe to our YouTube channel and press the bell for notifications. You'll be so glad you did because we're always putting out great sermons, new worship content, and it helps you know when we go live for our weekly services. We hope you have an amazing day and thank you again for watching. God bless.